Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Canadian Edition here. We're doing the P-47D German Captured Jug in a realistic battle. So this P-47D is actually an American aircraft. I'm just going to call it Jug. So it's the nickname for it because it, the fuselage kind of looks like a jug. Um, this particular version that we're flying is a German Captured version of the jug, as you can see by the paint scheme, the brown and yellow, and the markings on the wings and the fuselage, minus the Canada flag, which I put on there myself. Um, so in this game already, we have 2,068 score, four ground targets have been killed, and we have two kill assists. That is due to me, my fault. Um, there's a recording error on my bad, so we are going to miss that first part of the game. But basically, we flew in with our jug, nailed four ground targets with our machine guns and um, took out two enemy, helped our team take out two enemy aircraft with our machine guns as well. And now we are heading back to base to refuel and rearm. As you can see, we have zero MLR MGs. Um, so yeah, the P-47D, the Jug, I love this aircraft. Um, for unlocking all my German aircraft, this thing has been a dream to me. Um, this is a really tough, really fast aircraft. It doesn't turn very well. It's very heavily armed and has a really good ammo count for the armament. Um, it can take a beating as well, and it's really, really good at ground type. So in this episode, we're kind of mowing the lawn the whole time. Uh, mowing the lawn is a term used when you just stay at low altitude and mainly intercept ground targets. We also did intercept two enemy aircraft, but um, now we're going to come in for a landing, so let's just talk about this jug a little bit here, guys. So more than 15,600 Thunderbolts were manufactured between 1941 and 1945. The P-47 was supposed to be a light fighter, <laughs> ironically. It was originally tended to be a featherweight interceptor based on the small P-43 Lancer, which saw a limited service. But as the war in Europe demonstrated the need for much more robust warplanes, the company was forced to rethink its plans. Designers soon came up with a bigger, more rugged machine, the P-47. A prototype Thunderbolt first took to the skies on May 6, 1941. So here's a thing about the Americans. Uh, they like to think that everything they do is the best, and that's not true, because the war was already going on for two years and six months, basically. You'll have to quote, you'll have to source me on that. I don't know the exact months, but at least two years the war had been already been going on, and this thing has only took its first pl flight at that point after the war had already been going on for two years. So. I'm not trying to hate on America, but whenever they talk about the Jug, it's like, oh, it was the best aircraft ever, blah, blah, blah. Well, unfortunately, it can't be, because it wouldn't start service until well after 1941. But that's not to say it's not a great aircraft. It's just... There seems to be this misconception with war that one country did something better than another. Well, if we're truly going to look at it that way, then the Russians are the best, because eight out of Ger eight out of ten Germans killed in the war were killed by Russians. But that's not what war is. War is a collective effort between the Allies and the Axis. The Allies, up until 1942, didn't include America. So that's why a lot of people get upset when America talks like they own World War II. Anyway, not to sound like America didn't do anything, we all did our part, and that's the point. The Allies were a contributed, contributive effort between the French, the British, the Polish, the Canadians, the Americans, the Russians, you know, and, count, and others, I'm sure. So, Americans out there, if you're listening, hopefully I haven't offended you, and hopefully you're not one of those guys, who's, guys and girls who's like, you know, America. We all did our part, boys and girls. So the Thunderbolt ended up being a flying tank by the time they were done with it. It was a huge plane, three feet wider than the Mustang and four feet longer. And it had more than 10,000 pounds empty. 
It was 50% heavier than the Mustang, and nearly twice the weight of the British Spitfire. In fact, along with the three-seat Grumman Avenger, the P-47 was among the heaviest single-engine aircraft of World War II. But it could move fast. Despite its considerable mass, the P-47's 18-cylinder, 2,600-horsepower Pratt & Whitney R-2800 double wasp engine, the same power plant used by the Vought Corsair and the Grun Grumman Hellcat, enabled the unwieldy jug to keep pace with the Mustang. Both had a top speed of around 700 kilometers an hour, and while the P-47 could reach altitudes in excess of 12,000 meters, its range of just over 1,300 kilometers gave it half the legs of the P-51. So the real, the real downside of this aircraft was the range. The P-51 Mustang was a great interceptor because it could intercept bombers at very long ranges whereas other aircraft like the Spitfires and in this case the Jug could not even go half as far. The Jug packed a killer punch. It had four 50 caliber machine guns mounted in each wing. The Thunderbolt could shred warplanes and ground targets. Its internal stores were capable of ho holding 3,400 rounds. So that's basically double what the Mustang could hold. So the P-47 was able to unleash a torrent of lead for 30 seconds straight. Assuming the guns didn't jam, which they would. <laughs> but it was not a good dogfighter against smaller planes. It was best for boom and zoom. It was actually more effective as a ground attacking aircraft. The Jug was able to carry as much as 3,000 pounds of external ordnance. A fully armed P-47 can deliver half the payload as a B-17 flying fortress. Just think about that for a second. A four-engine heavy bomber B-17 flying fortress only carries 50% more payload than this thing. Or it would be it would be twice as much, wouldn't it? So. This, this thing carries half the payload as a four-engine B-17. That's incredible. So the P-47 was a very popular plane with pilots because it was hard to kill. The cockpit was roomy and comfortable, and it could absorb staggering amounts of punishment. Some, some pilots likened the uh, aircraft seat to a lounge chair. The bubble canopy which was added to the D model variants, afforded aviators with enhanced visibility as well. The plane's safety record was nothing short of astounding. Now, keep in mind, these are American figures that I'm quoting here, so you can't believe a word they say. But according to Americans, only about 0.7% of Thunderbolts were lost in action. But I don't believe that. So, I bet you a lot more were lost. Now here's the downsides of the P-47. It's not cheap. As we take out some artillery there. 15,600 Thunderbolts were assembled, assembled in the Curtis plant in Buffalo between 1942 and 1945. So that's an average of 360 a month for three and a half years, right? Each plane cost $85,000. Now that may not sound like much, but in 2015 that's about 1.1 million per plane. 1.1 million per Thunderbolt. So the War Department, <laughs> this is probably part of the reason for America's debt today, the War Department spent 1.2 billion dollars on P-47s before VJ Day, victory in Japan. and. That's roughly equal to $15.5 billion just on Thunderbolts. That's how much the Americans spent just on Thunderbolts. And they wonder why they're in debt. So 
So I'm not going to read you the uh, air kill numbers because, quite frankly, American air kill numbers have been proven to be quite false. For example, in the Korean War, they declared that their sabers shot down more MiGs than were actually fielded by the Russians, the Chinese, or whoever else combined. So we know for a fact that they lie all the time. Um, so I'm not going to read you their numbers. <laughs> But it was the preferred plane of aces. And guys, I don't want you to, guys and girls, I don't want you to think I'm hating on America. I love America. As a Canadian here, like, I love America. I just say it like it is whenever I'm talking about anything. So, like, all countries exaggerate their numbers, but America exaggerates their numbers a lot because it's propaganda, right? You want to, you want your country to be the best. You know, you want your war effort to be motivated. So if you inflate the numbers, then your troops will be more motivated. But unfortunately, for historical accuracy purposes, it kind of messes up everything. When people are figuring out that America claimed they shot down more planes than were actually fielded by the enemy. So they modified a P-47 and it actually broke a um, speed record, 810 kilometers an hour which no piston aircraft would top until 1989, but this was not a factory model jug. This was a jug that was given to a unique team to specifically modify it for this purpose. So it's not really, like if you're thinking that the jug you'll be flying in War Thunder will be setting speed records, think again. So more than 20 nations use the P-47. And actually, they became known as Cold Warriors, which means they continued to serve after World War II during the Cold War, some as long as decades after, even though they were clearly obsolete at that point. At least 15 original wartime jugs are still airworthy and can be seen on the North American Air Show circuit each summer. And I bet you they sound awesome. I'm probably going to check that out sometime. I would love to hear one of these babies. This, to me, is a symbol of an American plane. A big, heavy fighter. Powerful. Can't turn for shit. But fast as hell. With great armament and an amazing payload. And it can take a beating. This is a, an outstanding piece of engineering even though it was really, really over-engineered. Like, the Americans are kind of hypocrites because they talk about the Tiger and the Panther being really over-engineered. Well, the P-47 was over-engineered as well. It may not have been as unreliable as the Tiger and the Panther, but this thing cost the Americans $15.5 billion in today's money. Like if it, if it was if it was today's money back then, it would have been about 15.5 billion dollars just on jugs, just on this aircraft alone. So really, that's not sustainable. So this was kind of like a, I don't know. In my opinion, it was just far too expensive. Like that's why I admire the Sherman and the T-34 because they can just get the job done and they're cheap and they're easy to manufacture. These things were way too expensive, in my opinion. But they are great to fly. We're taking out a whole bunch of ground targets here. We're going to stop the history lesson now. Sorry if it looks like I'm checking out my TV screen all the time. I do take notes, and I do put them on a notepad on my television, broadcasted by a computer, and I do read them to try to keep me informed while I'm talking to you guys. So apologies if it looks like I'm checking back and forth all the time. As you can see, we got 15 ground targets killed and two kill assists. And we're going back to base to rearm our jug. We've got the Luftwaffe camouflage because this is a captured P-47. It's a premium 4.3 aircraft. We're flying on Operation Sicily on a realistic battle. And we don't have very many people left on our team. Me and three other planes are alive, as well as, I believe, two enemy aircraft. And what I'm trying to do with this jug is target ground targets. 
we are mowing the lawn in this game, so to speak. There are many vehicles, AA artillery positions that we are trying to take out, and the jug is perfect for that because it has 3,400 rounds in the 50 cal machine guns, which are perfect. So we're coming back for another landing here, and I do love the sound of this plane. It's just got that nice, rough, rugged, you know, like a rough chin, just that rugged sound. So as you can see there, one of our teammates in a Focke Wolf 190A has just been shot down by the P-38. His name is Nice Nuggets. And that guy was a good player. Nice Nuggets on the enemy team. I went after him for a while before I disengaged, and he actually used the speed of his aircraft to break away from me, and I had to break off because there was no point following him around the map. So he can eventually close, like, break off enough distance to turn around and then shoot me. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to keep up with him in a thunderbolt in the lightning. I think that's what the P-38K is. So there's some planes that can outrun this thing, especially those American ones. He was outrunning me, that guy. So we come in for a landing here. So that's why I was focusing on ground targets. He's the last. We have air superiority here. He's the last enemy aircraft, and. Uh, I can't keep up with his plane, and he's a smart pilot, and he knows that, so that's why I'm going for ground targets. Mowing the lawn, so to speak. Another successful landing there. Getting better at the landings, that's for sure. That one was really, really soft. It's fascinating, the sh these runways. They look like giant tiles with, like, cracks in the middle. Not sure how that would feel rolling over the cracks with those little aircraft wheels. I'm sure it would cause some sort of, like, bump. Maybe even a crash. But hey, what the heck do I know? I'm just a Canadian who plays War Thunder. <laughs> this particular mission was very, very enjoyable for me. I really am loving realistic battles. I know for some people this may look boring, but this is what War Thunder is for me. I like the realistic gameplay. You know, actually having a purpose in a mission and not just aim aimlessly flying around and, you know, like, these objectives aren't going to be taken out by anyone if I don't take them out. That's what I like about the realistic battles. You have your own little mission, you do your own little thing, and my thing this match is to attack ground targets and try to lure the enemy out. So as you can see, we got 15 ground targets killed, two kill assists, as our friendly G55S rearms and refuels as well. We are going back to enemy lines in our jug. Another interesting thing about realistic battles, you get all these different weather scenarios, and unlike the terrible game that is World of Tanks, they don't call it a new map. It's actually just a weather scenario, which is brilliant. So this weather scenario is beautiful, in my opinion. This is nighttime. You've already noticed, I imagine. In Operation Sicily. In the realistic battles. And I really, really, really like the different weather. The night, the day, the rain, the fog. Everything in between. It's It really adds an extra aspect to the game. That makes it enjoyable for me. As you can see, we got 3,400 rounds in our MGs and 22 minutes of fuel in our tank. The more fuel you put in your tank, the less your aircraft will maneuver or respond to your controls. So you want to put just enough fuel to get the job done and return to base, but not much more than that because at that point you're impairing your performance. You want to have enough fuel to last, uh, you know, your ammo and your guns for what you're going to do. As you can see, the enemy P-38J is taking out our vehicles, which is the objective right now. Several convoys of unarmored vehicles have made their way to the battle, and we need to take them out. You can see ours on the right there, those little blue dots, 
are our vehicles. So he's not taking out those particular ones, he's taking out ones on the other side of the map, as you can see there in the bottom right corner. So, I'm a level 37 in War Thunder, I'm not the most experienced player, and just recently I stopped playing arcade altogether and fully focused on realistic battles, maybe a month, two months ago. So, I'm not by any means a pro, but having realized there's vehicles to shoot, I'm not going to pass up that opportunity. So I'm making my way towards the enemy vehicles now. 3,400 rounds in my MGs, and I'm just cannot wait to shoot these guys down. You can see they're shooting us with anti-aircraft fire. Not doing much. Not too worried about it. So we're coming in our first target here, trying to get some sniper shots, trying to conserve our ammo. Target down. Two targets down. Couldn't get the third one. We'll come back around. We're doing a Immelman. Some sort of an unorthodox Immelman. The roll rate on this thing is terrible, as you can see. I'm trying to expect for a big, fat, heavy aircraft like this. And we messed up our Immelman horribly there, so we're trying to reduce the throttle. And I think I actually extend the flaps here. Or I will in a second. I usually try to keep around 80 or 70 and just use the combat flaps when I'm ground attacking with this aircraft. Gives you immense control over the vehicle. Two targets destroyed there. And we're taking out the vehicles on the enemy team. And there we can see we put our flaps to combat. And this thing turns, look at it turn now. So much more responsive with the combat flaps. And we're just going to keep our throttle at 70, just keeps around like between 3 and four, 400 kilometers an hour. Take out another vehicle there. And another one. Mission objective completed. So we're going to go for the other convoy of vehicles now. And this is actually one of our mission objectives, so we are really influencing the enemy counter here. And I imagine we are upsetting nice nuggets on the other team right now as he realizes we are killing his vehicles. So we're making our approach here. Our G55S is 11.67 kilometers away from us, so we can't expect support from him. I'm trying to bring the jug around to get a good pass on these vehicles. I should have just went right in and shot them. Hindsight's 2020. But I was trying to line them all up and just, you know, shoot them, like in a row or something, <laughs> so I could like get multiple targets at once, but I should have just went in and opened fire, because I'm actually just wasting time right now, but hindsight is always 20-20, right? So we're coming in, we got some vehicles up ahead, one down, two down, Oh, uh, pity we couldn't get that one there. So instead of turning the jug around, we're actually going to go shoot these vehicles over here. Which in hindsight is a bad idea. You should focus on one cluster at a time. Because it, once you take out a cluster, that's how you affect the counter. But I was being cocky, I thought, okay, I'll just take two clusters at a time. Let me take out another two targets there. We're just going to give her a bit of oomph because we're losing speed. And we're coming back to try and take out these other vehicles again. Now one thing about what we're doing here is we're very vulnerable. We're flying low speed, low altitude, not very much room to maneuver at ground level. So if the enemy plane does come for us, we'll be a sitting duck. But we're not worried about that. We're just focusing on trying to take out as many vehicles as we can, and we got three in that pass there. We look behind us and, oh, there he is, P-38J. So we try to turn, but that didn't work. We're getting shot. 
by getting shot, and there we go, we're down. We finish with 28 ground targets killed, 2 kill assists, but we were shot down. Thanks for watching, guys.